Let's get started, shall we? Um, I'll start about 20 past and we'll go over the exam. I want to go over the exam in more detail, but hopefully it's slower than I did last time. Try to figure out where people went wrong and why, kind of, kind of stuff. Um, exams were, were better than last, that's the last first exam. But, yeah, there's still room for improvement. So we'll be happy to let you get A or B. For a few people who haven't got there yet. Um, so, cranial nerves today. Carrying on talking about cranial nerves. Um, very good chapter in the book, of course. This is <coughs> chapter 8, Cranial Nerves and Pathways. Many of the material, many, much of the, uh, <coughs> the diagrams, not all of them, but a lot of them are taken straight out, straight out of an older version of this text. So, you all are reading ahead, of course, aren't you? Yes, you've already read this chapter because you know cranial nerves is next, right? Right, you know, I'm not going to uh, baby you and say, remember next class we're going to do this, and this is on pages one to five. It's here, <laughs> cranial nerves. We're doing cranial nerves. Before the class, you should read the chapter. Okay? Obvious. Um, and then go home and study after, after class. Okay, so cranial nerves, then we'll go over the exam. Um, back up one thing about the cranial nerves. Whoops, okay, this is the spinal cord, right? That's a cross section of the spinal cord. We're looking at spinal nerves. Our spinal nerves, all our motor neurons, of course, start in the ventral grey horn, don't they? Right, we know that. This is the ventral grey horn here. Our alpha motor neurons, our gamma motor neurons, the beta motor neurons, all going to start in the ventral grey horn. This ventral grey horn is usually called something when you talk about the cranial nerves. This is called a nucleus. The, the, the analogous to that is called a nucleus, this thing here. Usually it's a fairly simple name, sometimes more complex. It might be the trigeminal nucleus, obvious. Okay, or the oculomotor nucleus, or whatever. Sometimes we've got a, a fancy name when, when we look at the, uh, the parasympathetic fibers. Okay, so for a cranial nerve, we need to know the name of that nucleus. Every cranial nerve. Okay, we need to know for that cranial nerve where it goes, motor fibers wise. Where does it go? This muscle, this whatever. Okay. We need to know what happens, what, what the function that muscle is, or whatever we're talking about, obviously, and what happens if we get a lesion in that nerve. What will we see out of the effector site? Will we get medial surveillance? <coughs> will we get whatever? Okay, so we're going to need to know where the nerve starts, you know, the number of the nerve, the name of the nerve, obviously, where it starts. Is this in the, where within the brain stem is this? Is this in the medulla? Is it in the pons? Is it in the midbrain? Okay, remember they're numbered 1 to 12 basically. <coughs> the top 4 in the, in the uh, midbrain or, or old fact not quite there, but whatever. <coughs> next 4 pons, next 4 <coughs> medulla, okay? So you need to know where they start. Okay? In a, in a spinal nerve, we have a sense in your coming in the back. Okay? To either whatever, to, to initiate a reflex or go, to go up to the brain for sensation, whatever. But all those come in the back. These are sensory nerves. These are not motor nerves. Quite a few people told me in that exam, in the reflex, that this is a gamma motor neuron. A gamma motor neuron senses muscle stretch. How is that logical? A motor neuron sensing sensation. This is not a gamma motor neuron. So it's a sensory neuron comes in the back, goes into the dorsal grey horn. We have a dorsal root ganglion. We have the same thing in our cranial nerves, but it's got a different name. It's not going to be called the dorsal root ganglion. This thing, this swelling here where our cell bodies are, because these are unipolar neurons again, can have a name, unfortunately like the genetic ganglion, the blah 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 ganglion. We need to know that ganglion, where they go. So we need to know this name, okay? And of course, eventually we need to know where that sensation goes, what's the effect of that sensation, how it gets to the brain, okay? 
in our spinal nerves, we haven't talked about the, the autonomic nervous system. Okay, we're going to do a whole section at the end of the semester. In our cranial nerves, some of our cranial nerves have autonomic nerve fibers within them. Okay? Like, for example, the ocular motor nerve, this could be, for example. Those, remember, in an autonomic nervous system, there's going to be a chain of two neurons to, until we get to the effector. We're going to have a, a preganglionic and a postganglionic neuron. <coughs> Anything, in the sympathetic or parasympathetic, we always have two. There's got to be. A preganglion and a postganglion. Okay? Where these preganglionic nerves start within the brainstem, equivalent to the ventral gray horn sort of thing, will have a name. That is going to be a nucleus with a name to it. For example, the parasympathetic fibers in the autonomic <laughs> nerve start at the Edinger Westphal nucleus. We'll talk about that. So we need to know the name of this thing we jig here. Those pre neurons are going to end somewhere. That's a ganglion. They're going to sign up with the post neuron there. And that is going to have a name to it, unfortunately. So these things, we have to know the names of them. And then the post neuron is going to go to the effect. <coughs> OK? <coughs> we'll go over this a lot more with the autonomic nervous system, obviously, later on. But for now, we can remember, within our parasympathetic supply, within some of these cranial nerves, there's going to be a nucleus to start the thing, a ganglion halfway down, halfway down, but whatever, a, whether pre- and post-ganglion neuron synapse, and then they go to the effect. So those are things we're going to be mentioning when we look at um, the autonomic nervous system within these cranial nerves. Fair enough? Okay, so we've gone through these three sensory four motor and then the mixed cranial nerves. Um, this is what I talk about, kind of thing, a very complicated diagram, but that shows where the cranial nerves start and stop. Each of those things in the middle, that's the brainstem, slice of the brainstem. This is where our cranial nerves start. Those are the names of some of the things where they'll start and finish. And we're going to go through this slowly these cranial nerves. So the first one we very quickly review, we talked about trochlear nerves, didn't we? We need to know the names of all, you know all the six extrinsic muscles of the eyeball, right? You need the rectal, lateral, medial, superior, inferior rectus, superior oblique, inferior oblique. So those are your six muscles of the eyeball, extrinsic muscles. And they're shown in these various diagrams, pick which one you like. This is a good diagram showing not where they are, <coughs> but the direction of pull of each of those muscles. Okay, for example, on the bottom left-hand corner, they've got the superior oblique. That's not where the muscle is located. That's the direction of pull of that muscle. Superior oblique is, is this one at the top here, isn't it? This is the superior oblique up here. Properly in there. But this is the direction of pull primarily down <coughs> a little bit, but slightly outward here. Okay, inferior rectus down, lateral rectus out, whatever. So make sure you know where those muscles lie anatomically. I don't mean I'm going to test you on that, but you need to know that where they lie and what they do because when you get a, a lesion to that <coughs> muscle or that nerve, you'll see unopposed action, won't you? There won't, for example, if you lose your lateral rectus, it pulls the eye outwards, right? So, what will happen, what kind of squint would you see? Unopposed action would bring it in, wouldn't it? You'd see inward squint, or medial squint, or convergent squint, or strabismus, or whatever you want to call it. Okay? Or the patient won't be able to track the finger across <coughs> the midline. If you ask them to move the eyeball, this eyeball across, to follow my finger, they couldn't do it. Okay? So, superior um, trochlear nerve, superior oblique muscle, we're looking at, it's hard to glance downwards, vertical eye and vertical gaze palsy. The abducens, lateral rectus, remember. <coughs> OK? 
Okay, we find a nucleus in the pons. Nerve goes to the muscle, goes to abducens, abductor of the eye. So I can't abduct the eye outwards. Therefore, the medial rectus pulls it in. You can see on this lady on the left hand side, on her left eye is gone inwards. <coughs> so obviously, she has a left abducens nerve injury. Left lateral rectus is gone. Therefore, the ocular motor that innervates the medial rectus pulls the eye inwards. Okay, <coughs> fairly simple. Accessory nerve, remember, was this nerve that goes to the SCM and traps. <coughs> Shrugging your shoulders would be a problem. Twisting your head left and right. The SCM is a big muscle for turning the neck either way. Um, and it also goes to some muscles for swallowing. So it can, can affect swallowing. It, uh, if you have a lesion to the accessory nerve. What's it called? A spasm in the accessory nerve. Uh, uh, an infant presents, it looks like this. Spasmodic torticollis, right? So I'm doing this. Which muscle, which nerve is affected? My right or my left accessory nerve? I'm, I'm looking this way to my left. The kid's stuck like this. Which nerve? left or right accessory nerve and I'm doing this <coughs> which muscles in spasm I'm looking left right you agree I'm looking left and side bent to the right what muscle right of course this one here therefore what nerve <coughs> what nerve <coughs> right accessory nerve, obviously. Right accessory nerve. It's not complicated, folks. <laughs> it's not rocket science. Right muscle, right nerve. Damage the right <coughs> to the colus, you turn to the right. This is in spasm, <coughs> it forces the left, so, sorry, forces my head to turn to the left. <coughs> you've, got to know, you've got to know, obviously, what the function of, of, a, of a SCM is, and you all know that from an app. Okay? Um, what we talked about next. We talked about hypoglossal, didn't we? Muscle of the tongue, this is not taste. This is not taste, it's the muscle movement of the tongue. <coughs> the lowest strain on the earth. <coughs> the mucus in the medulla, obviously, that deep down. Problems with this nerve, you would have difficulty chewing, swallowing, moving stuff around your mouth. You'd have problems in talking if you can't move your tongue correctly, obviously. If I stick my tongue out and it deviates to the right when I stick my tongue out, which <coughs> nerve is damaged? You've got one tongue, but each side of it is supplied by a left or right hypoglossal nerve. I stick my tongue out, it goes to the right. Which nerve is damaged? Right or left? The, the right. Because you're on opposed option. I can't action, I can't push from my right side of my tongue to the left side of my tongue overpowers and you bend to the right. Simple as that. <coughs> Long term damage, you see actually of one side of the tongue. Chromos in the tongue. <coughs> okay, moving on. This is new, I think. Ocular motor nerve. Yes, we have to talk to you mention or not. Ocular motor nerve. This is one of our mixed nerves. You might see this on text called a motor nerve because it is, does not have a major sensory component to it, but some texts will call it mixed nerve because it has both sim a parasympathetic or orthomic nerve supply and a skeletal muscle supply. So it's got two types of motor fibers <laughs> within there. Motor fibers for normal skeletal muscles and motor fibers for um, the parasympathetic nerve supply. So the nucleus, for the, let's look at the skeletal muscles first. The normal striated muscle. Okay, we, we find a nucleus in the midbrain, the ocular motor nucleus. Simple. Okay, and it's going to come out and go to four <coughs> muscles, extrinsic muscles <coughs> of the eyeball. All those muscles that are not supplied by either the trochlear or abducens nerve. Okay, so that's your medial rectus, your inferior rectus, your superior rectus, and the inferior blue. Okay, everything except for superior oblique and lateral rectus, which are trochlear obtusive nerves. The rest of them. Okay? 
It's also going to go to a, nerve, a muscle we haven't mentioned perhaps before, this fella here, levator Veta Palpebrae Superioris. You just call it the Veta Palpebrae. The Veta Palpebrae. <coughs> that is a muscle that lifts the eyelid. Okay, it lifts the eyelid. <coughs> Okay, simple. Moves the eyeball around. Lifts the eyelid. Okay? And if you look at this one, where are we now? Oculomotor nerve pa paralysis on the patient on the left hand, right hand side, <coughs> on the left eye, on her, sorry, her right eye, what muscle is damaged there? What muscle is paralyzed anyway? Damaged, but whatever. On the on the person on the right hand side, she's got ocular motor par paralysis. Obviously, in her right eye, which muscle? Medial rectus. Medial rectus. <coughs> Left or right ocular motor nerve? <coughs> right, of course. I know people sort of confuse this in the exam. Like right. Now. I mean, if I say what muscle, what nerve goes to my right biceps, nobody's going to say my left musculotendinous nerve, are you? Some people kind of said that in the exam. I looked at this one on abusive nerve. Right ulnar nerve goes to my left, right pinky. Left goes to the left, right? Some people kind of confuse that in the exam. So obviously that's an example of the paralysis there. Okay, another thing it goes to, okay, so we've got those skeletal muscle fibers. Lifts the eyebrow, eyelid, should I say, and moves the eyeball around a bit. We also have these dotted lines. <coughs> these are parasympathetic nerve fibers. And you can see they've got a named nucleus where they start, unfortunately. You can see it here. The Edinger Westphal nucleus. Someone's called Edinger, but Edinger or Edinger Westphal nucleus is the nucleus. It's that black dot I was talking about here. That is the start of the parasympathetic supply to the eyeball. Okay? That is the start. That's where that preganglionic neuron cell bodies lie. Fair enough? Okay? <coughs> they go out, piggyback along the oculomotor nerve. They go through a ganglion, they sign up to the ganglion, like I said, they have to, because you have to have a postganglionic neuron somewhere. And that name of that ganglion is the ciliary ganglion. That grey dot here. That's where the preganglionic stop and the postganglionic start. <coughs> Okay, so our post ganglion neurons, then where do they go? They go to this sphincter muscle, the pupil sphincter muscle here. Okay? Which does what? A, if I contract that, what does happen to the pupil? Anytime you contract a circular muscle, a sphincter muscle, the hole in the middle gets smaller. So you shut the pupil down. What muscle does is innervated by the sympathetic supply? It's not in this nerve, but it goes there eventually to the eyeball. The radial muscle, those sort of radiating from the centre, remember? So you contract that muscle, the pupil dilates. When you're frightened, flight or fight, sympathetic drive increases, pupil does what? Dilate or constrict? Dilate. Okay? When you're scared, your pupils dilate. When you're taking a hard exam, <coughs> cognitive stress, your pupils will dilate. Okay? So this thinking <coughs> muscle shuts the pupil down. <coughs> What's the drug you can give somebody <coughs> that will dilate the pupil? It's a parasympathetic antagonist. Atropine. You squirt that in there, and the pupil dilates. You put on the plant was called Belladonna, deadly nightshade. You walk around and bump into walls, but you look beautiful while you're doing it. <laughs> okay? <coughs> it also, we haven't mentioned this before, but it also innervates the ciliary muscle. 
What does a ciliary muscle do in the eye? Adjust the lens. Adjust the lens. This is a, I think I grabbed this at the last minute. Remember the anatomy of the eyeball? The eyeball is, the, the lens has the suspensory ligaments, okay? And then you see this in green, the ciliary muscle right here, which attach by these ligaments onto, and the ciliary process here, onto the lens, <coughs> okay? So the ciliary muscle goes all around the lens and attaches by its ligaments all around the border of the lens. It is a sphincter muscle, the ciliary muscle is. It's a circular muscle around the lens. Therefore, if you contract this muscle or you send a signal down the parasympathetic supply to the lens, what will happen to the lens? It gets fatter, thicker. And when do you want to do that? To focus on something up close. Focus on something up close. So that as something comes towards you, accommodation, right? Accommodation is the, uh, the process of adjusting the lens to make it fatter. Okay? So the ciliary mm -hmm. muscle contracts shrinkens, in other words, like, just like the pupil, the muscle gets closer, as it were. The hole in the middle gets closer, the lens fattens under its natural elasticity, and I can focus on something coming towards me. Okay? So the parasympathetic supply is important <coughs> in near focus. Far focus, to see that lion attacking you and to run, that's going to be a sympathetic supply, and it counteracts this. <clears throat> this is when the lens loses its elasticity as you get older, so what do you have to do? You have to wear glasses to read. Okay, the ciliary muscle contracts, but the lens is sti stiff. It doesn't want to go fatter. Okay, it stays in that long-sighted mode. You can't focus on things close up. Therefore, you have you know glasses or contacts to adjust to allow to focus the light on the retina. So, damage, damage the ocular motor nerve. We've gone over two syndromes already that you'll see ocular motor palsy. What are they? Weber's and Benedict. Weber's and Benedict. Benedict. And you know the difference between you. Remember. Weber's is going to have this ocular motor palsy and contralateral hemiplegia, that's the key thing to see that, to diagnose that, where the Benedict's is going to have ipsilateral ocular motor palsy and this contralateral loss of body sensation and face. Remember that one? <coughs> Remember? A good time to go back and look at where those lesions are, what arteries involved in that, the posterior cerebral artery, etc., etc. So if you get an ocular motor palsy, again, you'll see potentially where we've gone, this thing. Okay? The eye might be pulled down a little bit because of unopposed action of the superior oblique. <coughs> the outwards is the key, the, the, the typical thing you'll see. Um, what else? What is a clinical sign, name for loss of the levator palpebrae muscle? What you see then? Ptosis, right? You mentioned that before. Ptosis, PT. That's when the eyelid droops because you haven't got, you know, that muscle activated. You're going to have. Would the pupil be <coughs> dilated or constricted? <coughs> Dilated, if you agree or not? Dilated, you're going to have a unilateral, if it's a unilateral oculomotor palsy, you might get bilateral oculomotor palsy, but usually it's a unilateral problem. You have a unilateral dilated pupil, fixed, unreactive to light. You can't <coughs> shut down when you shine a, a flashlight into the patient's eye, it won't shut down. Hopefully it's just because you've got an oculomotor palsy. 
more serious would be what? Cerebral herniation. Cerebral herniation, some problem in the midbrain, <coughs> in the brainstem. Because you've got pressure from an epidural hematoma or something like this. Hopefully when the eyes isn't shut down, it's just ocular motor problem. But often it might be an indication of something going on deep within the brainstem, which is pretty serious. Because you're going to get suppression of the vegetative functions of the brainstem, you don't watch out pretty quickly. Um, what's a, a, a unilateral, what's, a, what's it called when you have a um, dilated pupil? The technical term for that. Hydrasis. Hydrasis. <coughs> That's when you've got a, a, a dilated pupil. Also, you might see this term. is where basically a term for unequal pupils. One could be dilated, one could be, you know, constricted either way. But unequal pupil size and if it's for is, is the term for that. Hydriasis is a, a dilated pupil. Don't have problems with near vision. If you close one eye, if it's a unilateral issue, you close one eye, it's obvious. If, it's, if you don't close one eye, sometimes the other eye that does not have ocular motor palsy makes up for it and you don't notice that something's blurred as you bring it towards your face. You close one eye, wow, well, it's all blurry. You've got problems with the ocular motor nerve. Okay? Fairly simple. Let's move on. Question about ocular motor nerve. Simple. How is sympathetic? Plus somatic nerves within that within that. <coughs> Trigeminal. <coughs> big nerve. It's big, big nerve. Many, many branches. Those are three major portions. We talked about sensory before, briefly. <coughs> Those that the air is supplied by the three major divisions of the trigeminal nerve. The ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular is named after the regions of the face that they cover, as it were. Okay? Those... Uh, that's a better picture of it. That's a more complete picture, but it's a mess. <coughs> okay? So you can see those major big fat branches in there somewhere. <coughs> Um, remember that the, we mentioned first, originally, the two major functions of this nerve are going to be sensations from the face, not facial nerve, remember, sensations of all the face, and our uh, chewing muscles. We did this before, this is our <coughs> sensory pathways for pain and temperature, and touch and pressure. Okay, remember pain and temperature, key thing to remember that is pain and temperature is a contralateral projection, as you'd expect, as in the spinal nerve, same thing. Pain and temperature, though, goes a different, sorry, touch and pressure goes a different pathway, the green pathway on here. This goes a bilateral projection to the brain. So both hemispheres feel touch and pressure from the right side of the face. Both hemispheres, left and right, feel the left side of the face touch. Okay? <coughs> so those are the sensory portions of the face. You know, the, the very common diagram showing all the various bits of them. Um, these are the chewing muscles. So remember, all the muscles of the face are innervated by the facial nerve. So muscles of facial expression, when I wrinkle my brow, whistle, twitch my nose, that's going to be the facial nerve. But chewing muscles, these very strong four chewing muscles, the 
chewing food, obviously, are innervated by the trigeminal nerve. The temporalis muscle on the side of your face, you, when you chew, you can feel it contracting on the side of your head. Masseter, another big, powerful muscle. And these two muscles, the lateral and medial pterygoids, are innervated by the trigeminal nerve. <coughs> All of these muscles, these four muscles, close the mouth, elevate the jaw, except for our lateral pterygoid. The lateral pterygoid opens the mouth, opens the jaw. Okay? So remember, muscles of chewing is different from the facial nerve, muscles, muscle of facial expression, facial nerve, chewing, trigeminal. I think most people got this in the, in the exam. Um, let's look at the clinical aspe aspects. So if I've got a trigeminal nerve damage, a lesion to trigeminal nerve, you're going to have problems in chewing. You might have problems in talking, speaking, because you can't move your jaw as well as you would without it. Would that be dysarthria or aphasia? <coughs> dysarthria. It's not a central processing <coughs> problem. It's like cerebral processing problem. It's some, articul some problem with the jaw in this case. <coughs> okay, I'm gonna you're gonna resist the patient's opening of the jaw. So if you just open your jaw, it just drops through you can use it gravity. But if I resist it, it'll deviate one way with a lesion. I've got a lesion in my right trigeminal nerve. Which way will the jaw deviate when I under resistance as I try to open my mouth? The right. To the right, just like the tongue. Unopposed action, my right lateral pterygoid is damaged and therefore I get more push from the left and therefore the jaw will deviate to the right when I try to open it. If you have an upper motor nerve lesion in the, in the cortical bulbar tract, we'll, we'll talk about this later, but the cortical bulbar tract supplies the motor system of the cranial nerves, right? You can have a stroke or an upper nerve lead, upper motor neuron lesion in the trigeminal nerve and you'll see in that case an exaggerated jaw jerk reflex. Okay, so it's like a spastic response. Just like you get a knee jerk reflex, is exaggerated in a patient with a, with a stroke, you have an exaggerated jaw jerk reflex. What you do there is you basically punch them on the, on the chin. Or you put a, a tongue you press on the teeth and you knock that. Or you just basically just tap the patient's chin downwards with your fist, with <coughs> your fingers like that. And normally you see a little wee reflex, but it would be very exaggerated with a patient who's got a upper motor neuron lesion of the trigeminal nerve. Not a lower motor neuron, <coughs> an upper motor neuron lesion. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Probably the most common thing, problem you'll see in a click with the trigeminal nerve is this thing down here, the tic duolo. This thing. Okay? This is basically trigeminal neuralgia. Nerve pain in the trigeminal nerve. That's a fancy term for it. What you have there basically is, is usually idiopathic, unfortunately. It's a shooting electrical shock pain that goes down the course of the nerve. One of the branches. Usually it's the mandibular or maxillary nerve. A shooting electrical severe pain that can last a couple of seconds or less, or maybe 10-15 oh, minutes at most. Severe pain shooting down the face. Um, I actually got this once from trauma when I hit my knees and my face. I had a little skydiving accident. Did I feel about that in the anatomy? My chute didn't open. The first one didn't. I hit the ground going very, very fast. My knees came up and smashed my face. <coughs> and I got two black eyes, <coughs> a crushing fracture in the back. And that's when I came here for an interview. I was limping around with crutches, black eyes, and they felt sorry for me and they gave me a job. <laughs> <laughs> but still today, if I tap here, I can feel pins and needles going down this nerve. Before, it was like agony. This one's completely fine. This one, I tap here. I feel it twinging all the way down here. You'll think weird happened is 
when I when I blew my nose, my whole cheek puffed out like here. Why would that be? You think? I went, and a whole cheek blew out, all my eye right out here. What what happened? Why was that? Obviously, I think I must have disgraced my lacrimal duct. You know, the little tear duct that goes from the back inside of your eye down to the back of your nose. I think I bent, I'd broken off and gone into my cheek. So I went like that, the whole side of my face broke like that, it's kind of weird. <laughs> but is this ever going to get better? <coughs> um, <coughs> so yeah, very common to get this trigeminal, trigeminal nerve pain. Um, severe cases, you know, you give them uh, anticonvulsants or analgesics in severe cases to try to help this. Um, if you just unilateral, you will often lose, depending on the branch, if you've uh, got a trigeminal sensory issue, you might lose this corneal, corneal reflex. Okay. The corneal itself, <coughs> the covering of the eyeball, is required <coughs> by the trigeminal nerve. It's a sensory, the sensation of somebody poking you in the eye is going to be relayed by the trigeminal nerve, not the ocular motor, not the uh, the optic nerve. So the sensation of somebody touching the eye, this is one of the earlier diagrams, I think, that sort of blew it up here, okay, is going to be from the cornea, comes into the brainstem. Okay? And you can see here <coughs> the trigeminal nerve coming in and it's going to synapse in this nucleus here, the main sensory nucleus, and then you'll see a little internuncial neuron. Have you heard that term before? Internuncial? What does it mean? Interneuron. So another term, interneuron, whatever. So there's an interneuron here going bilaterally to the motor nucleus of the facial nerve. We'll talk about we get more about we get the facial nerve. But there's an, a, a muscle, let me just whiz ahead for you. This m muscle here is the facial nerve. This is the orbicularis oculi. It's a spherical muscle that and goes right around the eyeball itself. It's a gleeful muscle. Orbicularis oculi. We'll, we'll get back to this when we look at the facial nerve. But that nerve that muscle is, is responsible for closing your eyes. It's not your lid, it's like, you know, you really squint your eye closed, close your eye, okay? That muscle closes the eye down. So this is why you blink if you get, somebody touches your eyeball. If you get a, a touch on the eye there, it'll close down the eye. Close them from, you know, protective <coughs> response, obviously. If you lose this, Sometimes they might have to artificially lubricate the eye to prevent infection because you, you're constantly blinking to try to, you know, as, uh, <coughs> as dust gets in your eye, you, you blink and, and wash it away. If you don't do that, you might get it infected. Um, the cause of trigeminal neuralgia is typically idiopathic. We don't know. Um, usually it's over 40 years of age. Of the, tend to get it then. You might see it sometimes in MS, this trigeminal neuralgia, and it is sometimes brought on by weird things, like eating ice cream, cold or hot things, dental issues sometimes. They will suddenly bring it on for some reason. For PTs, you're looking at modalities here. You're looking at E-STEM, you're looking at massage, um, hot whole kind of treatment, modality, try to relieve the pain, but most of the time it will go away, hopefully, within uh, most a year or so. Um, <coughs> another reflex I should probably mention while we look at this, that contests the function of the, of the trigeminal nerve is the glabella reflex. I had this slide recently, so it's probably not in your notes. The glabella reflex. Again, it's the test of the functioning of your trigeminal nerve. 
Okay, what that reflex, what's it, where's your lab <coughs> labella? <coughs> it's not room. The glabella is this bit between your eyes. That, that bit of your forehead between your eye, you know, between your eyebrows. Okay, so try this. I'll try, try the reflex. On yourself, just tap it. And look at a partner and see what, what happens to your face when you tap that. <laughs> Anything? Nothing, right? <laughs> Nothing. Good. Now have your partner tap you in your forehead. Just gently. You have to punch them. <laughs> what happens? <laughs> <laughs> what do they do? <laughs> they all blink, right? <laughs> Every blink when you tap your forehead. It didn't work when I did it myself, but if I tap somebody else's forehead, it blinks. You all got that, right? <laughs> Now try this though. Tap them one, two, like this. One, two, maybe a couple of seconds or so. Just tap the forehead on somebody else. What happens? Go on. Tap them three or four times. Stop. Stop working. Stop. I can't blink. Stop, right? Every blink stop after two, three, four blinks, right? It's <laughs> supposed to, right? You get a custom, you can stop it. People with Parkinson's disease and or frontal <coughs> lobe damage sometimes and, the, and dementia, advanced dementia, but it's an early sign of Parkinson's disease, frontal lobe damage and or dementia, that does not stop. You can punch them half all day in the face <coughs> when you tap them in the glabella, but <coughs> by the way, that they keep blinking over and over and over again. You lot, it stopped in two, three, four at the most, I imagine, taps. You do not have Parkinson's disease. If you do not stop the blinking, that's called Myerson's sign. Myerson sign is when you give them the glabella reflex and it does not stop up you a two or three taps. It goes on and on and on. Early sign of Parkinson's disease. And here's that. We talk about this later on in motor control. You can electrically stimulate, do this, but this is the nerve. You can see the cadaver there. Oh, so what it does, let me go back to this diagram first. You can feel, so if you get your thumb, feel the top of your, <coughs> of your eye socket. A little groove there, right? You know that before? A little groove sort of on that in those squares. Yes? Can you feel a little groove in the top of your eye socket? A little divot there. That's the supraorbital foramen. Okay? And going through that is this nerve. There's a cadaver. There's his eye. So he's lying on his side here. There's that superorbital nerve going through that little groove you can feel in your top of your eye. And then you whack it, that's your trigeminal nerve, it's a branch of your trigeminal nerve. So you whack a patient in the forehead with your finger, that's the bit of the nerve you're hitting, and that's going to initiate, obviously it's going to go to what, what nerve, what muscle? Is that the same as the corneal reflex? You can get this. Rather than it coming off the cornea, I'm going to wax them in the middle of the forehead here, and it's going to come down to the facial, fire the trigeminal nerve, sign up to the facial nerve, and go and shut those blink orbiculus or oculi muscles shut down. Um, let's stop. Because we want to go over these down. Questions? Yeah.